Well, good morning. This is a progress report on the SAFE project. The SAFE project is concerned with making the web a better place. The web is the world's most successful application delivery system, but unfortunately it wasn't designed to be an application delivery system. And so while it has scaled really well, it comes with a lot of problems. Uh, the uh, web programming is slow and unreliable because we're using a stack which wasn't designed to do the things that we're trying to make it do. The web is a document retrieval system, which is something that it's very good at, but it's not an application delivery system. Um, the biggest problem we have in terms of its security is that passwords are easily guessed, stolen, and forgotten. So the first time, so passwords are a factor in computer security, not from the very beginning. The very first computers were defended by men with guns. That if you wanted access to a computer, you had to get by the soldiers who were guarding it. The first machines were built for uh, the Department of Defense during World War II and, and in other countries. But basically, they were all defended. Those machines were being used to uh, break secret codes and to design weapons. And that worked um, until the invention of the disk drive. When computers gained online storage, then it became possible to get at information in a machine without getting direct access to a machine, particularly after uh, uh, networking happens and computers are connected to terminals, like to the uh, early teletype machines. Uh, so at that point, it becomes necessary to have passwords. Uh, for example, you might have a time-sharing account which would allow you to share time on a mainframe, and that time-sharing account would come with a username and password, and, and that pair would indicate that you had an account, and so you were allowed to use time on that machine, and it would also determine what your rights were on that machine so that you couldn't get at material stored in other accounts. And that worked because there was only, it was unlikely that someone would have more than one time-sharing account, and people can easily remember one password. But then uh, personal computing happened, and we started over. The first generation of personal computers had no passwords. If you had direct access to the machine, you could do everything that the machine had. So it assumed that a program represented the owner of the machine, which turns out not to be a good assumption, but that's the assumption that uh, held for the, from the beginning of programming. When we start networking PCs, then we rediscover why time sharing systems had passwords. And so passwords are reinvented. So the first time we can see a password in connection with what becomes the web is in RFC 1738, which contains a format for a URL, which contains a username and password which are sent in the clear. And at least one of the authors of that document recognized that this was a problem. And so he said, the use of URLs containing passwords that should be secret is clearly unwise which is an amazing piece of understatement, because it's, it's much worse than that. So, um, so let's look at uh, what's wrong with the web. In order to make the web better, we have to understand what's broken about it. And this is a difficult subject. Many of you make your living on the web. It may be the only system you've ever worked with. And so some of the things I'm about to say are going to be shocking and upsetting. And I'll remind you, this is not about you. Uh, this is about the web, OK? So what's wrong with the web? Well, the biggest problems are that it is insecure, and it's way too complex. And it's way too complex because it wasn't designed to do what it's doing, and we've been adding functionality piecemeal over the years without a good plan as to how all of those pieces fit together. And so the thing is inherently insecure. So let's look specifically at the components of the web. The first is HTTP, the Hypertext Transport Protocol. It was designed to move a document from one place to another, and it does that very well. You can think of HTTP as being three things. It is a format for expressing key value pairs. It's sort of a fussy format. I think there are better ones, uh, JSON, for example. It's a negotiation protocol. 
which was very important in the early days of the web. Um, a browser and a server could negotiate as to what format or what protocol to send things in. Early web browsers were, were incompetent about things like image types, like a, an early browser might not know about pings, but it might know about GIFs. And so in asking for an image, there is a back and forth about what formats can you recognize, what formats can you deliver. And then at its core, it's a request response protocol that the client asks for something and then waits, and then the server sends something back and then possibly disconnects. That, that's the protocol, which for retrieving of a single document is just fine. I mean, that's about as good as you could hope to do, except that's, we don't do much with simple documents anymore. Now a document might re require hundreds of other components, images, scripts, uh, style sheets, whatever. And the original model was you would request each one of those, wait for it to be delivered, then request the next one, wait for it to be delivered, and so on, which is horrendously slow. So to mitigate that, browsers will open multiple connections to the same server so that they can be requesting things and they have some parallelism so that there's not as much time being lost in the back and forth, which increases the complexity of the system. Then there's DNS, the domain name system. This was a well-intentioned idea for making it possible for people to not have to learn IP addresses, that instead you could learn a short name for the thing that you want to connect to, which was a really good idea. Unfortunately, uh, it conflicts with the international passwords or international trademark system, that there's a confusion between trademarks as used in the world and domain names as they're practiced on the internet. And so there's constant legal squabbling about that mismatch. Even worse, DNS has its own security problems. There's um, uh, domain squatting where people can get to the, the wrong domain but think that they're on the right one. There are uh, uh, DNS poisoning attacks and other sorts of hazards. Then there's SSL, Secure Socket Layer, which is a secure protocol that was so bad that they changed the name to TLS, hoping that would solve some of the problems, but it hasn't. Um, we're, Every month we learn about more problems in the implementation of SSL. It's been going on for 20 years. You would hope that they'd be converging on something that's correct by this point, and they haven't. And they haven't been able to because it is really, really complicated. And when you have something as complicated as this is, it's really difficult to get it right. And the proof of that is that they still haven't gotten it right. The thing that I like least about SSL is its dependence on certificate authorities. Certificate authorities are entities which will cryptographically sign assertions, for example, asserting that some name is associated with some public key. And the security of SSL depends on the security of the certificate authorities, but unfortunately, I don't think they're very trustworthy. For example, uh, the most famous of the certificate authorities is VeriSign. I don't trust VeriSign. I don't know who they are. I don't know what they do. I don't know if they've if, they're, if they've been corrupted, I don't know anything about them. I have no reason to want to trust them. And in fact, looking at Wikipedia, I can see that they have been hacked and they have not been forthcoming about what happened in the hack. And so stuff like that concerns me. But even worse than that, there are hundreds of other certificate authorities that your browser trusts equally, some of which have already been compromised, and we know about that. And every once in a while, another one is discovered and removed from the standard list. But that's an ongoing source of vulnerability. So that makes me really uncomfortable. Then there's HTML, the hypertext markup language. Is HTML a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends on what you want to use it for. If what you want to do is create simple technical documents, which was the thing it was designed to do, it's really not very good. It's, it's fussy, it's hard to use, it's kind of ugly. It's why we invented markdown languages. Markdown languages do a much better job of the thing that HTML was designed to do. Now, if you're using HTML as a container format for interactive applications, it's really bad at that because that's not what it was designed to do. We've, we've added patches to it over the years to enable it to do things, but it, it's really problematic. Uh, 
one of the things I like least about HTML is that the state of the art for doing HTML applications is templating. And I hate templating. Templating is the major injection point for XSS attacks, which is the, the biggest security problem on the current web. It also leads to a style of program development in which everything, all levels of your stack are fixated on HTML generation. And that can go in every layer, even all the way back to the database. So everything is concerned about HTML generation and not on delivering value to your customers. And it's also a trap. Since everything wants to be always about HTML, it makes it really hard to contemplate moving applications to a better technology because there is so much invested in the current stuff. Then there's the DOM, the document object model, which is the API that JavaScript, or that JavaScript is presented from the browser. It is one of the worst APIs ever imagined. And when web developers say they hate JavaScript, usually what they mean is they hate the DOM. The DOM is just awful. It's at the wrong level of abstraction. It's buggy. It's not as portable as it should be. It's weird. Uh, if you were to take your favorite programming language, delete all the standard libraries, and replace them with the DOM, you would hate that language. It's just the DOM. My biggest problem with the DOM is it's inherently, every, inherently insecure. Every node is connected to every other node, which means that if an attacker can get access to any piece of the DOM, they get access to everything. Then there is CSS, crappy style sheets. Uh, so, and then there's JavaScript. JavaScript was designed in 10 days, designed and implemented in 10 days, which is a really amazing accomplishment. You know, designing and implementing a brand new language in 10 days is really amazing. Unfortunately, it turns out you can make a lot of mistakes in 10 days. And unfortunately, Netscape released that language in its unfinished form to the world, and it got standardized and frozen in that form, and we're stuck with it. The good news about JavaScript is that there is goodness in the language. And if you're working with just the goodness of the language, it's actually one of the best languages we have ever seen. So that part of JavaScript encourages me. And as long as we can constrain ourselves to that part of it, I think we can make it work. So I'm not the first to have observed that there are problems with the web and that the web needs to be replaced. In fact, many companies have tried to do that very thing, including Microsoft, Apple, Adobe, Oracle, and many others, big and small, all thought there was an opportunity in replacing the web with something better. In almost every case, the technology that they were proposing was clearly better than what the web already had. Unfortunately, in most cases, the solutions they were proposing were not open which is why I'm glad that they all failed. The thing that I like best about the web, the reason why I think the web should be saved, is that it's a completely open system. Anybody can uh, launch a, a web server and, and do stuff on it. You don't have to get permission from anybody. You don't have to agree to split your profits with anybody. It's an open system. Anybody can, can work with it, and I like that. And I want to preserve that going forward, and that's something that the proprietary systems would have prevented. I think the reason the other systems failed wasn't because they weren't open. It was because they didn't have an adequate transition plan. That they didn't have a way of moving people from the old web to the new web. Their focus was on moving the developers, but they forgot to consider the audience. So, um, so that's why it didn't work. So my proposal is to upgrade the web. I don't want to replace the web. I don't want to capture it. I don't want to turn it into something else. And especially, I don't want to close it or turn it into something proprietary. I want to keep it doing what it does well in exactly the way it does not today. And hopefully, that stuff will work forever. But I want to completely change the way it does the things that it doesn't do well, simply because it doesn't do them well, and we deserve better. So that is the goal of the SAFE project. It's a, uh, we're proposing to make a radical, minimal, secure, open solution to repair the problems of the web. It's going to be architecturally very different from the old web, but it's still, still something that we'll be able to deliver through web browsers. Um, in the SAFE world, 
customers will not have passwords at all because we know that passwords do not work for humans. And so having a system that is dependent on passwords ultimately will fail everybody. So instead of passwords, we're going to be using public key cryptography for authentication, which is what public key cryptography was intended to do. That's what it was invented for, but it has not been used adequately for that purpose yet. And we will not be using certificate authorities because certificate authorities are not trustworthy, and so we're not going to use them. So this is the outline for the SAFE project. Uh, we've scheduled it as five parts. The first part, um, SAFE node, we'll talk about that in a minute, then the SAFE protocol, the SAFE resource management system, then SAFE apps, and then finally we get into the browser with the SAFE helper app. So SAFE node is a module for adding cryptographic services to Node.js. That includes Elliptic Curve 521 for doing authentication, uh, AES 256 for doing link encryption, and SHA-3256 for doing hashing. We're also developing our own random number system because it turns out random numbers are critically important in doing cryptography. And um, we've seen lots of systems fail for not having done randomness correctly. So one of the big problems in setting up a random system is uh, collecting enough entropy so that you're confident that the numbers that you're generating are distinct from all of the other numbers that have been generated anywhere. And that's where most cryptographic, cryptographic systems fail. So we're going to be harvesting entropy from the operating system, because operating systems now are doing a lot of work at trying to collect entropy. But I don't trust them to provide us sufficient quality of entropy for our purposes. So we're also going to be harvesting entropy from your microphone. Well, with your permission, when you install our system, we'll turn your microphone on for a couple of seconds. We're not listening to you. We're listening for noise in the environment. And we're going to try to collect enough noise so that we can be confident in the quality of the randomness that we generate. We'll do the same thing with your camera. I'll turn your camera on for a couple of frames. We get most of our noise actually from the very first frame before the camera has figured out what's going on and it's all noise. We love that. That's the thing we want to see. And then we'll immediately turn it off and we'll never turn it on again. So we'll take all of that entropy, we will harvest it, process it, encrypt it, and then persist it. And we will then use that to seed all of our random number generation going forward. And the next step is the SAFE protocol. SAFE protocol is secure JSON over TCP. And it's a, an application uh, session-based protocol. It's not a document retrieval protocol. So the way it'll work is you'll, make a re you'll just send messages. It's not requests, it's messages. And a message could contain a request or it could contain a response. It's a full duplex thing, so messages can be going both directions at the same time. There's a, a very smart guy named Zuko who uh, has proposed a triangle model for naming systems uh, and said that there are three useful characteristics you could have in a name. A name could be meaningful to humans. It could be securely unique, which means no one else is going to have that ID. And it can be globally decentralized, meaning there's no central depository or issuer of identifications. And that you could have that all three of these things are highly desirable, but at most you can have two of these. And so the, the one that the web chose was the top one, human meaningful, at least to the extent where you think a URL is a human meaningful thing. But I'm more concerned with security, so I'm going with the other two. And so the way you will be identified in our system is with a elliptic curve 521 public key. Um, and this also requires that you keep your private key very secret, and we will do as much as we can to help you accomplish that. So your public key will never be sent on the wire, will never be shared with anybody. That is your secret. And you need to defend it and never lose it, because if you ever lose your private key, there's no way to recover it. So you'll have to start your life over. So um, to remind you about uh, cryptography, 
There are two major forms of encryption. There is symmetric, where you use the same key to encrypt something and decrypt it. And then there's asymmetric, where you use a public key to encrypt it and a private key to decrypt it. And we take advantage of both of these. So one, one of the characteristics of the SAFE protocol is the SAFE handshake, in which we can establish a secure connection in one round trip. So this is how it works. We've got Alice and Bob who want to connect to each other. Alice starts knowing her own public key and private key, so everybody is going to know their own key pair. And Alice also knows Bob's public key. That public key is the entity that she knows she wants to connect to. Bob starts with his own public key and his own private key. Alice will then generate a random handshake key. This is a 256-bit symmetric key that she's going to use to encrypt some stuff in her first message. And her first message will first contain the safe flag or the safe property that indicates that this is the safe protocol and that we are version one of the protocol. And SSL allows for negotiation about different cryptographic styles and, and strengths. We don't have that. We just have a very brittle, this is the level, and you know, either tell me what level you've got or, or not. You don't get, the attacker doesn't get to choose what level we're going to use. Then it also contains Alice's handshake key encrypted with Bob's public key. And then the handshake key is used to encrypt Alice's public key. Um, we could send Alice's public key in the clear, um, but we're going to encrypt it to provide a little bit more privacy. Although I think traffic analysis over big data could easily reveal that anyone using Alice's IP address is Alice, but we're going to try to provide a little bit of privacy anyway. Then Bob receives that message. Uh, because he has his private key, he can decrypt the handshake key. And because he has the handshake key, he can decrypt Alice's public key. If he has already had a relationship with Alice, he now knows who she is, and she is logged in. If he hasn't seen this before, then this is probably an onboarding experience we're connecting for the first time. In either case, Bob will generate a session key, which is another 256-bit random number, which will be used to encrypt further messages. And he sends a message back to Alice, which is encrypted with Alice's handshake key, which will contain the new session key that's encrypted with Alice's public key. Nice thing about this is that uh, there are no man-in-the-middle attacks possible. and um, we also have uh, forward privacy in that if one of these private keys is revealed, you still cannot be, uh, obtain the contents of any of these messages without getting both of the private keys. And so we have very good characteristics. And we're doing it in one round trip, which is very nice, particularly in mobile networks and distributed systems where accumulated latency is the biggest uh, Onward going performance problem. So uh, Alice will, can then uh, decrypt all of that stuff, and she now has a session key, and that session key will be used for all further messages in this session. This is a full duplex protocol, which means that either party can be sending messages at any time. So it's not limited to request response. That if the server has something and it needs to tell Alice, he doesn't have to wait for Alice to ask for it. He can just send it. If Alice wants to send him something that doesn't need a response, Bob doesn't have to send a response. Um, if Alice asks for three things in one request, she can then get three separate responses that fulfill those. So it's a completely different pattern of how we do communication compared to what we do over HTTP. And um, we also provide two distinct ways of sending messages. There is the normal message send, which is a reliable message send. If for any reason we're not able to send it, we will persist that message and try to send it in the future after the connection is reestablished. There's also a status send, which we think will be used for telemetry and gaming, where we'll have a message and 
We'll try to send it. If it doesn't go through, we don't care because we expect there'll be a later message that'll be more up to date. So if for some reason the channel gets broken, which happens in mobile systems all the time, you want the latest version. You don't want to first to get all of the expired versions first. You just want the latest, latest one, and data send will accomplish that. Then part three of the state system, or the safe system, is uh, resource management. So we want to be able to access assets by their hash code. So if you want to load, for example, a piece of code, instead of asking for it by name, you'll ask for the cryptographic cryptographic hash of that entity and its length. And you put that into the network, and then the network can return it. And you're guaranteed to get exactly the thing that matches that and nothing else. So you don't have to worry about any version changing or, or even worse, corruption happening in, in transit, that you will always get exactly the thing that you wanted. This has very nice uh, performance properties in that it doesn't matter where you get the asset. In fact, you can get the asset from the world's most dangerous server, and it doesn't matter. If the thing that you got back matches the hash code that you asked for, you're guaranteed you got exactly the bunch of bits that you wanted. We're doing this primarily for secure program communication, but it can be used for all resources. So we think this is going to be a, a generally useful way of requesting resources and managing them. Then Safe Apps is an HTML-free JavaScript-based application delivery system built on Node and Qt. Qt is an application delivery system that was developed in Norway. It was part of Nokia for a while, but it's now open. It's really nice stuff, and it can be written in JavaScript. So we're going to take advantage of both Node and Qt to provide a container for making applications. So this is our, our architecture. We've got uh, two JavaScript systems running. The Node system, which is being used for uh, network connection and persistence, and the Qt system, which we're using for display and user interaction. And the two communicate over an asynchronous JSON channel. So you've got two JavaScript event loops happening simultaneously, one for your program state and communication, and one for your user interaction. So we're going to get much cleaner program architecture in the safe system than we get on the web. The web tends to confuse these issues, and we're going to make them very, very distinct. So your application will have multiple presences. There'll be one presence in the Qt system, there'll be a presence in the node system, and you'll have a presence back in your server. And the three presences will communicate over a secure JSON channel. We can also provide cooperation under mutual suspicion, that we can have third party components running in the same space, which will be divided in the same way, so that I can have another company, another entity running things in the same container, sharing space on the screen, um, communicating with our stuff, but unable to corrupt our stuff. We're un unable to corrupt their stuff. So we can all be working together for the benefit of the user. So this provides a way of doing secure mashups that cannot be done in the current web in any way currently. We're also going to provide trust management for users so that they can keep all of their credentials and all of their relationships in the cloud and easily share all of that stuff over all of their devices. We'll provide a pet name system so that they don't have to memorize 521-bit keys, which people can't do. Um, instead, they'll be able to assign a relationship, a particular name that is local to them and their devices so that they can reliably get to the parties that they want to reconnect with. Then the next step is going to be to package all of that stuff in a helper app so that it can be made available to browsers. So anybody remember browser helper apps? Maybe the, the old guy remembers it. So the first web browsers were incompetent. They didn't know about how to do a lot of stuff. So if you wanted to play a sound or display an image type that they didn't recognize, Instead of just failing, they could be programmed to launch another application that knew how to do that. So if you wanted to look at an a image type that the browser didn't know, it would open up a paint program, and Photoshop would show you the picture. Or it could run a, a MIDI program, which could play a sound. 
It turns out that is still in all the browsers. We don't use them anymore because the browsers have gotten much better at doing this stuff, but the stuff is still in there. And if you search through the options, if you go deep enough, you can find the thing where you can map types and, and protocols to applications. And so we're going to use that to, to get in. So we'll develop the safe uh, helper app. You can install it on your system. You can tell your browser to use that when you want to get at the safe protocol. And that will allow you to test the system and determine that it works and, and to try it out. Now, I expect that most of humanity will never do that. You cannot convince people to load something anymore and install it on their machine. So in order to take the next step, we need to convince the browser makers to install it. So, um, or to integrate it so it becomes standard equipment. So the goal of the SAFE project is to provide safe and effective relationship management on the web without breaking the web. So this is the transition plan. This is the thing that I think that the other attackers of the web miss. But I think this could work. So step one, I need to convince one progressive browser maker to integrate the, the safe, self, SAFE helper app into their browser. That, Technically, it should be an easy thing for them to do because we're, we have very few points of contact with the browser because we're providing all of our own stuff. All we need is a rectangle in which we can put pixels. We need um, access to UI events, and we need a JSON channel between the browser and, and the helper app. And that's all we need. So that's something they should be able to do very easily if, if they want to. Then we need to convince one secure site to require its customer to use that browser. Um, and that's something companies have been reluctant to do up until this point. They've been trying to make everything run everywhere. But if you're a company that's doing critical stuff on the net, it's really scary working on the net since the net gets compromised all the time. And they are waiting for something like this. They would really like someone who can help them escape from all that password recovery stuff and, and just make everything work. So if we can get one of those to work, then uh, risk mitigation will compel other sites to do the same thing. I think this is going to be similar to the Penguin model. If you remember how penguins work, penguins have been on the ice all winter long and they're really hungry. Um, so at the end of the season, they all move up to the edge of the ice and they're all looking in the water because they know there are fish down there, and they really want to go get them. But there are also leopard shark, clear seals, and sharks and stuff in the water, and they don't want to get eaten. So they look, and they're all watching, and they start crowding, right? And they kind of crowd, crowd, pushing each other. And eventually, one of them falls in, and everybody looks. And if he comes back up, then they all jump in. And so I'm hoping this will go the same way. If we can convince one penguin to try this, and if they are successful at it, I expect many more will want to follow. Then competitive pressure will move the other browser makers to want to do the same thing. So I don't know who the first browser maker will be. I'm pretty certain it won't be Apple, um, and probably won't be Google. Good chance it might be Firefox uh, at Mozilla, because Firefox used to be a technology leader, but um, they have fallen behind. It's really difficult to keep up with companies as well funded as Google and Apple. So this might be a, an, a, an inexpensive way for them to leap ahead and get some market share, that they become the leader in secure applications. That might be an attractive thing to them. It might also be Microsoft. And Microsoft used to have, well, Microsoft has done some brilliant work in Edge. Edge is an amazing piece of work, and nobody cares. It's just, you know. And so they, they might like to get some attention on that too. So you know, if they are the first to integrate SAFE, then they can say, and we're the first to, to do the security stuff well. So that could be a good thing for Microsoft. Once we get one of those to do it, I think eventually the other three or four or however many will want to do it as well. And, and then eventually, I think the whole world will want to shift to the SAFE platform because it'll be a less expensive way to create applications It'll be much more secure. Your customer uh, support costs will be much lower. Your security incidents, I hope, will, will vanish to nothing. And um, you know, I think you would, you would like that. 
and nothing breaks. I'm not proposing that anything in the current web stop or be invalidated or diminished, that there are things that the web does really well, and I would want the web to continue doing those things really well. And the things that the web does badly, I would like to see that migrate eventually to the safe system. So um, it's difficult when you claim to be making secure software. You have to make sure that it does what it should, which in software in general is a very difficult thing to do. You also have the requirement that it shouldn't do what it shouldn't, which is much harder. Um, and it turns out no software is initially secure. So everybody who's ever claimed to be making something secure, they have shipped stuff, and it turned out to be crap. And that, that has always happened. And it's always really embarrassing, and I expect it's going to happen on this project as well, because that's just how it goes. Um, so we'll release this stuff, and I'm sure we'll get slapped with stuff, which is really embarrassing, but then we'll go and fix it. And because we're taking a minimal approach to this compared to the maximal approach that we've seen in other systems, I'm confident that we're going to converge on something which is secure enough whereas other systems that are out there in wide deployment have not, that they have not converged on something that is sufficiently secure. So there's nothing new here. There's no new science, um, no new technology. We're taking advantage of uh, capability theory, which has been out there for many decades. We're just packaging it in a way which I think is small and effective and, and should work. So this is um, where we are on the SAFE project. Uh, SafeNode was released last year at, or no, uh, what year is this? This is, we're in 16 now. So a couple years ago, two years ago at OzCon. Uh, Safe Protocol was, re was released uh, last year, also at a different OzCon. Uh, it's, uh, so Safe Protocol is available on Node. We are now extending it so it'll also work on iOS and on uh, Java. So going to make it easier for using uh, Safe Protocol. And I think the so Safe Protocol has applications beyond the Safe project. I think it'd be a really good thing for doing web applications and distributed processing. Um, anything with microservices, I think, would be much better done over the Safe Protocol than over HTTP. Uh, then we're um, currently in development on the Safe Resource Management System. I hope to have some announcements on that soon. And the rest of it will come eventually. Um, I have not announced, and I, I refuse to announce, when any of the other things will be done. I, I have a schedule in mind, but I'm not telling anybody what it is, because uh, I believe that good software takes time, and if you try to make it take less time, it takes more time. And if you tell anybody when it's expected to be done, then you're expected to deliver it then, and I don't want to be held to a time requirement. I want to be held to a quality requirement. So I'm trying to work in secrecy as much as I can and get as much of this done good and have a lot of confidence in everything we do before we release it. But well, thank you for that spontaneous applause. Yeah. I think that's how all software should be developed. I, I, I don't think it makes sense to push software to a deadline knowing that what you're going to get is crap and it's not going to work and it's going to cause cruft and, and bloat, which is going to slow everything in the future down. I think that's a bad way to make software. But that's the industry standard, so that's what we're doing, right? But I, I think we can do better than that. So if, if uh, you want to, to watch the progress, oh, oh, anyway, once we finish things, we are then open sourcing it. So we're fully open, um, most liberal license we could find, which was the MIT license. So you're free to use it for any purpose. Um, and if you want to contribute back to us and, and help us to, to continue the thing, that's great. Uh, but you're not required to, so um, that, that's the, the nicest way I think we can do it. And it's all, uh, you can, uh, safe.place will currently direct you to GitHub where you can see the source for the first two projects. So that is the SAFE project. Um, so uh, that's the SAFE project, so thank you. So we have a, uh, some minutes for questions, if anyone has a question. Yeah. Uh, 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 go ahead and say it. Two 
Um, so the only part of the system that is complete enough to measure is the SAFE protocol. And I believe that's significantly faster than the web. For example, um, SSL takes three or more round trips. We can do that one round trip. So just that means we're going to be significantly faster. And we don't have uh, all of the overhead of HTTP headers, which can be huge, especially if your cookie policy is out of control. They can be extra huge. We have no cookies. We don't need them. We're a session protocol. So all of that stuff goes away. So on the wire, we should be significantly faster than the web. Uh, I have uh, no performance data yet on, on the application framework, except that um, uh, Qt for doing our, our UI stuff has access to GPUs, so all of that stuff should get accelerated, and we have at least the potential of that stuff being really fast. And we have the two event loops, which means that if anything happens to hold up one thread, the other thread is still running, so we can make more progress than a browser can with its single event loop. So again, I have no data to, to support any of that, but my intuition is that our application performance should be extremely good. about uh, private key. So you mentioned that everybody should have its uh, own private key. So how am I supposed to keep my private key or store it? Should I carry it with my cell phone slash memory or is it supposed to be on cloud? And if it's on cloud, then uh, I also need a password again to access that everywhere. So right, that, that's a really good question. So the biggest problem we have is how do we manage the private key? Because that's a, a really difficult problem. So your private key will live in all of your devices. So it will be in your phone, it will be in your computer, and whatever else you have. Maybe in your watch, you know. Anything which will want access to the safe network will have your private key in it. And we will encrypt it on the device um, as well as we can. Although um, my biggest concern in this architecture is that we're depending on the operating system to not attack us or facilitate attacks on us. And operating systems currently don't give any guarantee of that. And so that worries me that all software is, is vulnerable to attacks from beneath, right? So we're going to do everything we can to try to resist those. But until the operating systems get better, that is a risk. The other thing that we'll do is um, We'll take everything except your private key and allow you to designate a place in the cloud for where that goes. And it will be encrypted with your stuff so that only you will be able to get at it. So as long as any of your devices are working for you, you've got access to your private key. But I, I will recommend that you also store your private key someplace else. And you could store it on paper, like maybe as a barcode or a QR code that you could retrieve later, or on a USB stick or something like that and put it in a safe deposit box or in a secret place in your mom's house or you know, just some place so that if something bad happens, you can go and recover it. But um, you know, it's an important secret, so you, you're going to have to manage that. Thank you. The thing is that uh, I should always carry it with myself. If I don't have it, then I can't access my own personal information. The good thing about password is that you just memorize it, right? But private key, you always need it somewhere with you. Somehow. Right, but the problem with passwords is, so when the web, when the first secure website came up on, on the web, and so how do we secure it? Let's have a password. Everybody can remember a password, and it was great. And then the second site happened. How do we secure it? We'll do it the same way they did, and and that worked when it was like three or four or five. But now you're, you have affiliations with hundreds of websites, and every one of them needs a separate password. And humans can't manage that. That system is breaking down. So we're coming up with a system which has at most one password, which is the password that you would use to protect your device. And then once you're in the device, it should be you. So the other bit of science that I'm waiting for someone to do, that I'm hoping someone will figure this out by the time we get the whole thing finished, is a better form of biometric identification. Right now we've got biometrics for logging in, but that's not good enough. I want to know that you are the human who has control of this. So if someone grabs your phone, 
I want it to lock up. I want the device to know that, it, that I am not in control of it anymore. Um, and, and it will not unlock until I have control of it again. So uh, that's something we should have always had. We haven't had it yet. Um, so I'm hoping we get to that as well. So I, um, I have one question. I'm not quite sure how to ask it, but I guess um, is the Qt API going to essentially be kind of its own sort of DOM, but like a DOM done right? And then I guess the other side of it is um, I don't see RFCs in your list there. Is that just like something from the ancient past, or is that something that might happen? Um, OK, so the first question, uh, the answer is yes. If you remember what the question is, that was the answer. Um, the second one is RFCs. So we're not advancing any of this stuff to standard yet because it's not ready. So I, I think something, uh, there, there's a problem in the way that standards are practiced. I think a standard should be a codification of best practice. And there are some standards which do that, and, and they're excellent standards. But most standards being developed today are speculative. There are new ideas that haven't been tried. Let's put it in a standard and see if anybody likes it. I think that's exactly the wrong way to make standards. And so I don't want to propose that any of the stuff that we're doing move to standard phase until we have proven that it's good and that it works. Once we've done that, then yeah, I, I hope that all of this will be standardized either at IETF or ECMA or W3C or wherever is appropriate. I, I don't care at this point. But uh, we shouldn't do that until we've done the work. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering if the applications will have to be developed using JavaScript. And JavaScript seems to be very popular these days. Um, but it, it seems like it might, might not be really suitable for large programs. Uh, if JavaScript is written well, I think it is suitable for large programs. Um, one of the problems with JavaScript is it's uh, being a multi-paradigm language, it's really, and also in some aspects, not a well-designed language, it's really easy to go off the rails and write stuff that's bad and that's not scalable and, and all of that. Um, but I don't think it's significantly worse than anything else. I've, I've seen million dollar mistakes in Java. I've seen multi-million dollar mistakes in C++. So all languages are, you can write crap in any language. But I think well-written JavaScript is really good. And our recommendation is that people start writing JavaScript well. Yes? A couple of questions. Uh, one, have you already noticed any real pushback or obstacles put uh, in front of you by the industries or companies that are, you know, their business is at risk if this gets really popular. And second question is, uh, security uh, side is probably vulnerable to social engineering. Is this solution better in this sense? Uh, so your first question, no one from any company has approached me and, and asked me not to do this. So I've not heard anything like that from anyone yet. Um, are we more resistant to social engineering than, than other systems? Yeah, uh, significantly because um, the user does not have a password to give up. So if you look at most sorts of phishing and, and other sorts of things, the ultimate objective is to try to get their password, try to trick people into revealing their password. In our system, the password is a 521-bit private key, which the user probably would not even recognize. Even if they had it and they were trying to type it in, I'm not sure that they could give it up under duress. So um, I, I think we're, we're much stronger in terms of social engineering than the, the current web, certainly. Any thoughts on transitioning broken web apps or getting them ready to be safe web apps? No, we haven't given any thought to how we transition old web apps to new web apps. Um, and, and it, frankly, it'll be hard because the, the model is going to be very different. Uh, the way Qt wants to work is radically different from the way the DOM wants to work. And so there's going to have to be a lot of reworking. Also, the, the 
split container model where all of your UI goes on one side and all of the state goes on the other. That's very different. I think that will yield better applications in the long run, but it's going to make transition much more difficult. So my expectation is that mostly what we're going to see is new applications being written for SAFE, and old applications will stay in the old web until they are ready to be rewritten. I don't expect there's going to be a lot of, because transition is going to be so difficult, I don't think we're going to see much transition. On the uh, protocol handshake um, slide that you had, you had the assumption that Alice already knows the public key of Bob. Right. How do you uh, envision the distribution of public keys? Really good question. So uh, this is the safe URL. It's the ugliest URL uh, ever, ever imagined, as far as I know. So it contains all of the information that you need to make a safe connection. It contains the public key, which uh, in uh, base 32 encoding would be 105 characters long, which is ridiculously big, and the IP address, which in uh, IP6 is also quite large, and an optional referral code, just in case we need one. And so where do you get this? Uh, so if you're in the old web and you click on this URL, that transits you into the new web. And so that's how we know the public key. So where do you get this? The best source, I think, is going to be Google, right? If, if I search for something and Google says, this is where you should go, I, yeah, I'd, I'd trust Google way before I trust VeriSign. So um, yeah, we can go that way. Another way we could do it is we could put this on a QR code on a billboard. And you figure, well, no one could put a billboard out in public you know, surreptitiously. That, that's probably going to be a good thing. So you could snap it, and that would take you. Or you might be at your bank, and your banker hands you a card with a QR code on it and say, scan this on your device, and now your device is fully connected to the bank. And it'll have encoded on it this information. And because they already know who you are, you know, boom, you're fully in. So there are lots of ways that we can figure out how to do it. Um, the advantage that we have that SSL didn't when it was being designed was we have a working web that we can bootstrap on. And they didn't, right? They, they, have, they were still trying to figure out how to make the web work. So, um, and, and it's a very different uh, perspective in that on the web, the assumption is you're connecting to something probably for the first time. That was, that was the, the web surfing model. And SSL is really optimized for that case. We're optimized for the other case. We're optimized for the thing we're going back to. And we assume that once we've connected to your bank, and if you say, let's go back to my bank, we don't have to go back to Google. We don't have to go to DNS. We don't have to go to anybody. We know everything. And we'll just go directly there. Yes. Uh, wait just a second. Regarding this previous question, is it possible to have a C name and use the same DNS system uh, like www.something.com, which goes to this URL? Is it possible as a C name? I mean, instead of using QR or uh, scanning something, the same old web, but uh, underlying using this system? Uh, I suppose. It might be a version of this um, that we haven't considered that might be of practical use. I, I can't pull that out. Hi. Um, one advantage of the password that I see is that I can go to any computer, whether it's at my job or at a friend's house, and I can log into Wells Fargo without having my private key on that host. Uh, how does SAFE address that scenario? Yeah, that's a really good point. So that's something that the old web can do that uh, the SAFE system cannot. Um, in, in fact, we would go even further that you should be the only user of all of your devices. You should never share anything with anybody else. So it's a, a very different model 
for how to do things. Um, but it's the only one that works from a security perspective. You know, if, if you type your password on your friend's machine, your friend knows your password if, if, if they care to know it. I mean, that you've given up something really important. Um, you know, internet cafes, they still exist. And if you type anything important in those, they discover it all. So uh, our, our feeling was uh, devices are becoming cheap and ubiquitous, ubiquitous, ubiquitous enough. And we're all carrying around portable stuff, which can do pretty much everything we need to do all the time anyway. So we'll depend on that. And to prevent sharing, we're planning on having an information or public service campaign that goes with it, which will recommend that you don't share your devices in the same way that you don't share your toothbrush. If there's a similar level of discomfort that you know, if anyone should touch your thing, you should not like it. And, and the old web will still be there to do that stuff in, in the cases where we still need it. That, that's the other thing about the SAFE project. Since we're not trying to capture or replace the web, we're just trying to augment it, we can provide safe avenues for different kinds of behavior and allow the old web to do well what it, can, what it always did well. I think we're done. All right, well, thank you very much.